Hello guys and welcome to Strategic Command World War II World at War. This is a war game apparently akin to the Panzer General series with some, in my opinion, grand strategy elements thrown in. It's a game I've definitely been looking forward to playing but not a game that I've really gotten to play yet. So this is going to be my first full playthrough of the game don't expect me to know a whole lot about how the game works or to be very good at it. We are going to verse AI. This is a 1v1 game between the Axis and the Allies. It does have multiplayer, so my goal is to do some AI playthroughs. One is each side and hopefully I can get someone from the SRU group to do some PvP in this with me because it only has PvP. So let's boot up single player. There's a bunch of campaign scenarios that we can pick from. We are going to pick just the default one, 1939, World at War. This starts with the invasion of Poland. Uh, the turns are 14 days each. And when you take your turn, so it goes like this. So the Axis goes first, end turn. 14 days have passed. Now it's the Allies' turn. They end turn, that's another 14 days. So between both sides, about a month goes by every time you go through each pair of turns. The victory conditions for this, for the Axis would be to control the capital of Germany, of Italy, of France, of the UK, plus the city of Manchester, of Russia, plus the city of Stalingrad, of Egypt, of Japan, plus their ownership of Seoul in Korea, plus the wartime capital of China in Chongqing, plus the capital of India, the capital of the Philippines, and the capital of Australia. That is what the Axis need to do in order to win this game decisively. The Allies, in order to win a decisive victory, must control the capitals of Germany, Italy, France, the UK, plus all of their adjacent hexes, so a little more demanding on one spot, but no extra cities thrown in. They must also control the capital individual hexes of Russia, America, Japan, plus Seoul, again, uh, the wartime capital of China, and the capital of India. So, not entirely all the same things there, looking at places like Manchester, Stalingrad, Canberra, not exactly thrown into both sides, Cairo, but you still have to stop your opponent from taking these things over, depending on what you have and what the opponent doesn't have in order to stop them from winning. The Axis definitely feel like they have the harder goals to win, but they seemingly leave out America, so that might actually be easier. I don't really know. Either way, we are going to be playing the Allies, is what we're going to be doing for this first one, because I figure while learning the game, I might as well play the side that historically had, like, no chance of losing, especially because the core nations, as we can see here, have no chance of changing. The game does have a diplomacy system if you want to move non-aligned nations into your sphere, or vice versa, someone that's not already guaranteed to be on that side from the start. So, the Axis guarantees Germany, Italy, and Japan. That's it. The Allies guarantees UK, France, America, Russia, Poland, China, and India. So, in this game, that means there is no chance of the what almost happened in history, USSR joining the Axis, which they vehemently applied to try to get into, and were like denied and invaded at the last second. So they're guaranteed to be on the Allied side, but places, for example, on the Axis side, historically, like Bulgaria, Romania, looks like they may not be guaranteed, but I believe there's probably events to help push them that way, and also the diplomacy system, of course. We're gonna be playing as the Allies. I'll do my next playthrough as the Axis. We have difficulty settings here that change, I know, scripting as well as computer bonuses, which you can change the bonuses themselves separate to the actual difficulty, but we'll just leave everything on what I believe to be normal, which is intermediate. I assume this is just the default difficulty, and that's what we're going to play with. And now we have a bunch of options here. If we want certain counters, we can have 3D images, or we can have... I know there's a way to turn that off. Yeah, there you go. NATO counters. Uh, my vision's terrible. I cannot tell what NATO counters are when I look at them. I can tell that this is a tank and that this is a ship. So that's what I'm going to go with. These are all the options. There's advanced options as well. For example, there's soft build limits that you can turn on to escape a hard cap 
on units that you can create in the game. For example, a limited amount of infantry armies or tanks, for example. We're going to leave the soft build limits off and go with the historical limits because I believe the AI will probably function better with those in place because once you get past the hard limits and you, you go into the extra stuff with soft build limits on, I believe there's penalties to currency and I don't believe the AI will handle that very well. I'm going to disable the end of the game, basically the end date, which is in like 46 or 47, and make it so that for there to be a winner, you must get a decisive victory. So there will be no draw, no minor victories. We are playing until one side gets a decisive victory. I want to test that out here because I feel like that would work really well in a PvP when we get around to it. And then these are the rest of my settings that you can see here. Before we get into it, it is also worth mentioning that technically in this game, you can choose to play a limited amount of nations instead of an entire side by assigning AI to control nations on your side. But since I believe you can't really do that with multiplayer, we're just going to play the whole side as long as it might make the turns and make the playthrough because that is what we'd have to do in PvP, and it'll be a good challenge. So with that, let's hit OK. Let's get our game started. The axes are going to go first every time, so the way the series is really going to go is we're going to boot it up, we're going to watch the axes do their turn, and then we're going to do our turn. And in an axis playthrough, we would kind of do it, you know, the same way, it's just the turns will be different. I would do my turn as the axis, and then the allies would do their turn, we'd watch that, that's generally how I would do these. And then multiplayer would potentially be different just because um, you have to go back and forth. But extra war, German troops invade Poland, Nazis bomb Warsaw. So we have a nice little pop up here. It's like a news thing of a jig. World War Two has begun. Funny, they didn't know it was that back then. But let's go. So right now I cannot do anything. We are just watching the Germans or well, the Axis take their turn so again i don't really know how to play and there's not really much of a tutorial in this game there's a manual i think it's like 300 pages or something so we're gonna be figuring th things out as we go i see they have fortifications along the uh magino there that appears to be japanese are doing air tactics looks like fighting our troops bombing um, I believe I have the setting on that speeds up the animations of the enemy turn or just animations in general, which is why it's going so fast. But if I didn't do this, I think we'd be watching this for a very long time. So we can see the Germans are beginning their invasion of Poland. The Japanese are trying to push into China, dealing some damage to some of our troops here. The Poles are fucked, you know? I, I doubt we could do anything to save Poland. I, I don't think that's possible. So the Germans are just, well, you know, they're blitzing in, you know, they're, they're destroying these cavalry brigades, they're destroying the Polish infantry, storming into the country, look at that, surrounding us, there really isn't much we, we could ever do about that, I, I don't think you could change history that much here, Poland's probably guaranteed to die, I, I think it's just a matter of how long can we hold them off, probably. Polish morale suffers from battlefield losses. I assume it's like uh, that might be guaranteed or that might be an event that happens when the Poles lose a certain amount of units. Either way, this game does have national morale, which is a very important thing for determining if a nation surrenders or not. And I believe they're fighting efficiency as well. Australia's declared war on Germany. That's good. Now they're in the war. The UK declared war on Germany. Good. France. Yep. Partisan activity in Manchuria. Oh. So what that is right there is when you take something over and it doesn't really belong to you, like you've conquered it, I think this mainly affects the Axis. It could probably affect the Allies too if they go warmonger happy. It would be that if you leave a city undefended by moving the units because you want them somewhere else, then the partisans can hurt your supplies from there which i believe can hurt your mpps which i believe is your just global currency and then in addition to that you can get free partisan units if you are the side that that tile belongs to so world war ii has begun two chinese places were captured 
Four Polish places were captured. Australia joined the war. UK. All right, shit's kind of going through. I can't read it. Polish suffers morale. Yep. All right. So I think there's a chances to like when certain countries join the war as well. Like Australia joined, but I didn't see New Zealand joining. So they might do that later. We'll see. Either way, we have an event. The U.S. has advised to keep her navy within the Pan-American zone. To the President of the United States, the European war is a threat to the peace of the Western Hemisphere and Pan-American solidarity. At the recent Panama conference, we adopted a declaration of general neutrality and established a naval Pan-American security zone. The zone averages 300 miles in width and runs south from the city of Halifax through the Caribbean. In the Pacific, to avoid complaints from isolationists, reducing U.S. mobilization levels, we should avoid having three or more U.S. naval units within 30 hexes of Midway Port or three or more land and or air units on either Oahu or the island of Hawaii. Recommendation, limit our own naval activity within this zone in order to maintain neutrality. Okay, I see. So mobilization, I believe that is this percentage here. I did some reading of the manual before I started. So this is mobilization, I believe, and this determines the overall capacity of your MPPs that you produce every turn. I don't actually know what MPP stands for, I just know it's like a global currency. So the higher it is, the more you produce. And so every nation has a cap of how much it can produce. I believe you can trade these between nations on your side, but only through events. For example, the American Railway, I believe in Indochina, leading up into China, and also the UK and American shipments to the USSR. In, like in World War II, the USSR got pretty much all the supplies they needed to survive from the UK and America, the backbone of like two-thirds of the world's economy, without which they would have died. So I assume this game's going to have ways for us to trade these MPPs and then, because, you know, if they didn't, then I, I don't know how we would ever win, like, not win, but keep certain nations in the game. So, I'm not going to remember this, and I don't trust the game to help me remember it, so I'm going to take a screenshot of this and save it so that I can remember it. Moving along, we have a decision to make. Secretary State of War. All right, so this is for the UK. It's addressing the nations, like on a personal basis, since you can technically play as each nation individually, and I guess to kind of sp help specify who it's towards. But, now that we're at war, it is expected of us that we will send a British expeditionary force to France, just as we did in the last war. Arrangements are in place for the BEF to be transported across the channel and deployed around Rowan on the... Oh, I can't read this date format. On October 1st, 1939. Once there, these forces could provide boost to French morale, which is rather fragile. If we do not send the BEF to France, then French national morale will fall by a thousand points. Can we see the numbers right now? No, we cannot. And the USA will move five to eight percent away from the Allies. Okay, so I guess your alignment to joining the war might be different than mobilization? Or they might be the same thing? I don't know. Either way, we'll find out. Would you like to deploy the BEF in France? Press yes, or risk consequences of deploying in the UK instead? Press no. So we have notes. If you say yes, and it's strongly recommended to do so, then at the start of October, the BEF will deploy at Rouen in northern France. It will consist of a Strength 5 HQ. I, I don't fully know what the HQs do in this game, but I guess we'll figure it out. One Strength 8 Army and two Strength 5 Corps. Once the BEF are in France, their presence will provide small boosts to the French national morale. If you say no, then the BEF will deploy at Portsmouth in southern England on September 15th, 1939. However, by saying no, France will be shocked at our lack of support and French national morale will decrease by a thousand points. Isolationists in America will also make capital out of our lack of desire to defend our French allies, and this will move the USA 5-8% to 8 away from the allies. The BEF isn't sent to France, but other British units were sent to France before France falls. They could provide bonuses to French morale, but the initial shock to French morale is unlikely to be made good. Okay, so I don't know how ahistorical we can get with this. I assume Poland's going to die no matter what. I assume there's no way we can hold France, right? Theoretically. If Germany can't do it, then Italy would be the final nail in the coffin, right? 
That's my thought. I assume France is going to die anyway, but theoretically, the longer we can keep them alive and the more of a fight they can put up, the better. So we do, in my opinion, want to send the BEF to France. So let's try that out. Now we have one for the USSR. Red Army Headquarters, now that the German invasion of Poland is well underway, it's important we do not show weakness and let the Germans gain the whole country. It is therefore important that we fulfill our side of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact by marching into Poland, even though it will cause some slight harm to our relationship with the UK and France. Would you like to order the Red Army to prepare to advance into Poland? Even though it will cause slight harm to... They didn't care about that in history. <laughs> also, do not show weakness. USSR wasn't worried about not showing weakness. The USSR thought the Germans were their best friends. And they didn't care about the UK and France. They wanted to join the Axis. This is weird. Uh, I feel like these events are being written with hindsight. This decision will play a key role in determining the boundaries between Germany and the USSR after the Poland has fallen. And if we do not advance into Poland, the Germans will have a good starting point from which to invade the USSR. Given our current poor state of readiness for war, saying no could put us in a very compromising situation. Saying yes and advancing into Poland will provide us with the possibility of increasing our income. Okay. By capturing Lwow. I'm gonna butcher names. Uh, I'm not sorry. I'm American. I'm not Polish. Or whatever other nation's names I fuck up. <laughs> and by holding the fortress of brest we will be able to slow the German invasion that is bound to come within the next few years. Note that even if we do say yes to this and invade, it's possible the Germans will refuse to honor the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact and force us to withdraw from Poland. Designers note, this advance is fully handled by the engine, so it's neither possible nor required to manually move any Red Army forces into Poland. Okay. Oh, there's also a view map button. So we can kind of see where the event is. All right, so uh, can I move around uh, with the arrow keys? Yes. So brest to to Laval. So we would probably go up this line here. Okay, yeah, that would push us in there. I assume... Okay, so... It's hard to show, but look right down here when I hover over something. Value, 5 MPP. Value, 2.5 MPP. Separate to the supplies. Value, 2 MPP. So cities produce MPPs. So yeah, the longer we hold that, the more money it would make us as the USSR. Again, I'm pretty sure Poland is as good as dead. There's no option to necessarily just say, hey, USSR, just go help Poland right now. The USSR's mobilization is only at 26%. So, we probably do want this, assuming the AI will follow exclusively, like, historical decisions. They will invade the USSR, and I guess as much of a footing as we can get as possible is smart. Poland is just going to die. Look at their little numbers here are, like, grayed out. That must be their morale being low. But the USSR can only go up from here, right? Well, so can Germany, but if Poland's gonna fall no matter what, we might as well stop or try to stop because apparently this could potentially still not work. Germany from getting as much as they can. So, yes, they will advance into Poland, the USSR. And with that, the Axis turn is done and our decisions are made. And we have this world map showing everything that we have right now. Now we can see the morale. So, Poland's down to 73%, China's at 86%. Japan's at 90, Germany's at 99, everyone else is pretty much at 100. So, yeah, our guaranteed nations right now, like I listed, are right here, but not all of them are in the war. Right now in the war is Poland, China, uh, UK, France, and actually it doesn't show Australia, and I just remembered why. So, yeah, it looks like New Zealand is not in the war. So... When a minor country, I remember reading this, when a minor country joins the war like Australia, they don't join the war on this bar here. They're not controlled independently. What they do instead is they join the war under the major nation. These are majors, that's what it is. So the majors are guaranteed, the minors are not. They join the war on the side of the major nation that they are closest aligned to. And then their MPPs go to that major nation their troops are still made as them maybe i can see that somewhere so we're the uk yeah so we have australia so we can still hire australian troops and they have australian limitations 
that we have to operate by, but it's not the Australian economy that pays for this. The Australian economy, plus everything else the UK has, as we can see here, these are all the colonies that are currently in the war, that contributes to the UK's overall MPPs. UK pays for them. Their economies help pay the UK to pay for them. The UK controls them. And that's kind of how it goes. France also has Madagascar, French Somaliland, America has Panama, but America's not in the war. Oh, does America not have the Philippines? That's weird. Maybe maybe that will show up later. I don't know. USSR's by itself. What? No Tanutuva. Poland's by itself. China's by itself. Is there no uh, Red China? Maybe there's an event for that. Because the Red Chinese were a thing. I find it kind of funny how India is considered a major power, where India should just be under the UK like everything else, right? Maybe there's a balancing reason why they're not, but India is also not in the war right now, which is good to remember. So that's our side right now. The UK was some of the colonies, France was some of the colonies, Poland and China. Fighting Germany and Japan, uh, Germany has Slovakia, and Italy's not in the war yet, but once Germany starts going after France, we can expect, historically, I assume, Italy to start marching down here, and we don't have a whole lot here to prepare for that. So we can immediately start fighting, although we probably don't want to. We probably want to reinforce. We have some bad French morale in some locations, but I believe when the Brits arrive, the French morale will improve. Also, so we can see these three-man stacks here. I believe these are cores, yes. And these four-man ones are armies. Armies are better than cores. Cores are better than garrisons. Does France not have any garrisons? No. Let's look at China. I'm sure they do. Uh, here's a garrison. So a garrison is one-man kind of stack. Garrisons are mostly for holding things and preventing partisans. Is there a way to see partisans on the map? That's a good question. Maybe it's like P. Oh, yeah, it is P. Would you look at that? Common sense controls. Okay, so here's all the places that can have partisan activity. So I assume this having like a crossed out might mean, well, I don't know what that means, actually. It might mean that it can have partisan activity, but not spawn a unit. Or it might mean that it's garrisoned, therefore there can be no partisan activity. No, that's not true, because we know here in Manchuko, Manchuria, whatever, there was partisan activity, but it hurt the supply. So that's, I think that that's exactly what this means. So the Japanese must have their own thing where they have to keep things here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so China's gonna be a big thing for partisans. Uh, France, yeah, I know Europe doesn't have nearly as much in terms of partisans. China has a lot of that, so that's that's pretty important gameplay. America has absolutely like nothing in the way of partisans. The UK surprisingly does, but it's mainly just supply stuff. And then, yeah, most of that stuff is in China. So Japan is gonna have the hardest time with that while fighting us. I just found this neat little war map thing here where you can see what every nation a nation is at war with. So like. China appears to be at war with Japan, but not the European powers. The UK and France are at war with Germany, but not Japan. So it's not even as simple as one side versus one side. The nations really do have their own independent wars and everything. We can see a strategy map, which is just the same thing as when we zoom out that shows us all the units we can see and vice versa. We can see all the nations in the map that can be pulled one way or another into one of the sides. We can see a convoy map, and uh, I assume, oh, what happened? I assume this is, yeah, okay. UK Arctic convoys to the USSR. So this has prerequisites before it starts. Yes, okay, so that hasn't started yet because the USSR needs to be 100% mobilized. Yeah. So when the USSR is basically in the war, the UK will start shipping Arctic convoys and America probably is something like that as well. Maybe it's just UK to them, but the US sends up to the UK. So I guess that's like an indirect way of doing it. Venezuelan oil to the USA, Canadian convoys. All right. So what is actually active right now? Oh, South Africa can mobilize. All right. So Australia is in the war. So not only, yeah, not only 
is Australia getting their MPPs given to the UK, but they seem to have an extra thing here where they have supply convoys being sent, which seems to be different based on the season in terms of effectiveness. And New Zealand can get this too once they're mobilized. Yep. Dutch East Indies ships oil and rubber to Japan. Okay, so Japan has the DEI helping them, but eventually they would invade and lose that, I guess. Oh yeah, Netherlands. Oh, this is so complex. Oh, it's this Indian supply convoys to the UK. Oh, so I can customize this one. Oh, because I can customize it because India is a major. Huh. Okay, so maybe this is an extra. Maybe this is literally the way shipping overseas MPPs is handled. Maybe this is all of Australia's MPPs. And because it's overseas and not by land, maybe that means, uh, yeah, Mediterranean, Sudan. Yeah, that might be how this works. Maybe it means it can get intercepted because of how it works. Yeah, that, that seems to be the case. But India being a major can choose how much to send to the UK. So I can like reduce this or raise this. It caps out at 25%. I imagine the UK having MPPs is more important than India. So I guess I'll leave that as B, Norwegian, Swedish shipments to Germany. Yeah, so there's a lot of stuff here to think about. I found the research. We also seem to have a lot of different ways of researching for every single major. And some majors are already researching things by default. France is not. I assume that's because the game and Poland. I assume it's because the game's like, oh, well, they're going to die anyway. So they didn't really get any further than this. Uh, we assign MPPs ourselves in order to research stuff as well. So MPPs have to go into research. I believe they also, yep, they have to go into diplomacy probably. Yeah. So you have to use diplomacy to assign chits, which are limited, to try to pull nations towards a specific major. As well as, you know, you have to purchase... Uh, some units that cost MPPs as well. We have production already in effect. So there's historical production happening. When you buy a unit, it's going to show up later. Like it's going to take time to actually produce. So you don't get it the moment you buy it. So that's going to be something to keep in mind. France doesn't have a lot of stuff coming by the looks of it. But there's a good reason why, probably. Whereas like America, they have a good plan of what they're making. The UK is making stuff. So that's stuff that I don't have to pay for, but I assume Germany, Italy, Japan have stuff like that as well. So let's look at the nation that's going to be the simplest to deal with before anything else. Poland. There's not a whole lot we can do here. Pretty much guaranteed to die. It's just, what can I do to make dying take longer? So we only have garrisons on these two very important locations. However, these garrisons are five out of six level entrenchment. Which sounds a lot better than breaking entrenchment in any way. So, we probably just want to hold positions and take advantage of any level of entrenchment and let them come to us with the, I guess the, not including these fighters and tactical bombers. If I do things from here, these, these fighters are just going to get rushed. And if they get rushed, you know, they're just going to die. So... I don't know if this is smart. Uh, I'm thinking of just kind of moving them back here. And hopefully they'll be out of range. That's kind of my hope. I guess we'll find out. So I'm going to move you here. And that kind of takes your turn. You can't really do anything now that you've done that. I put the, the attack bombers in there. Don't know if it would have been smarter to put the fighters. But I'll move the fighters uh, back across this river as well. I don't know whether to put it more north or south. I guess let's go north. Uh, we have the Capardi army here, which is actually just in an open plain next to a fortress. Let's move him back one tile. He'll defend from here. And there's a tank here, a mechanized unit, actually, that I'd love to pull back, but he's on a city anyway. He's going to die anyway. I feel like it's better to just leave him in the goddamn city probably not great but we just need to i think i'm going into this as a complete noob be defensive here and 
So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to have it stay here and be defensive. We have almost no MPPs to spend as Poland. It's not like we're going to liberate Poland anytime soon. So with that in mind, I guess I'll leave this cavalry here to die. Uh, it's got one point left. So it's something to drain an action from the enemies for the sake of the garrison on Warsaw. Uh, this army is pretty damn close to Warsaw, so I'm going to put all my points into reinforcing this to being a little bit stronger. So maybe could hold these fortifications a little bit, which I see are directional, which is almost a little bit concerning. I don't know if I should leave this man here or bring him down to Lublin. I guess if he's here, he can kind of protect the air a little bit for whatever that's worth. I, I, again, I really don't know what the hell we're, we're doing here, what will accomplish what. This garrison all the way up north, I feel like this isn't, like isn't going to help me at all up here. I feel like this is just going to die. But if I move it, it's not going to be able to get anywhere. Unless I had, you know, saved points to operationally move it, but it'll just stay there for now. It'll just stay there for now. I, I don't expect that I'm doing particularly smart things right now, anyhow. Um, you will stay on this city. I feel like that's good enough. I can attack, which doesn't sound smart, but who knows? Maybe a guaranteed two kills is smart rather than let the, like, even if we lose two, rather than let the Germans find a more favorable way to do this fight. We actually lost three, not two, so I see that's only an estimation. Good to know. I'll go ahead and retreat this army up through here. Just kind of be more of a buffer. One to one, two to one. Uh, okay. I'm afraid to attack. I, I, truly, I am. Let's go ahead and attack with this one. Okay, we killed two. We lost two. Well, that's a shame. All right, maybe I'm not doing very good at slowing down the advance by actually doing attacks. But I don't think this is going to make too much of a difference. You know, Poland will fall. Um, they will move over to France next. France, that's going to be interesting to figure out because France also has a navy we have to worry about. So red target with blue bullseye, that's French stuff. Spread around the world, they have some cores, they have uh, garrisons and such in their colonies. Nothing too great. There's also some French colonies that actually have the French flag here. This might be important to look at for dealing with Italy eventually because I know they're going to come marching in there. And then blue target with red bullseye, that's British stuff. But some British stuff also has the British flag, which is a little confusing. I think for starters here, I have the general feel of the game now. However, I think I'm learning how to play it. I don't want to make episode one too long. So I'll end it here, even though this won't be the usual format of how these videos will go. Just knowing that this first turn is probably going to be the longest one with learning a lot of mechanics and giving orders to everything and everyone. Uh, so the rest of the turn will probably take a whole nother episode anyway. So we'll do that over on episode two. We'll finish up turn one. And then I imagine from that point onwards, we'll be able to fit at least one full turn back and forth, Axis and allies every single episode. Let me know what you guys think about this game. And if you think it's gonna be fun, just generally leave your thoughts in the comments below for me to see. and. For now, I guess, thank you guys very much for watching, and I'll see you on the next one.